So, welcome. Welcome to Pipeline. Um, what's the collective noun for DevOpsers? I don't know. Cluster? I'm not sure what the... A, a, it's, it's probably an avalanche, isn't it, when you get that many snowflakes together? I think it's a... Yeah. I don't know. Anyway, so, ops and operability. So, this talk, I feel this is a duty of care talk. Uh, um, I've given this talk a couple of times. This is a new variant of it. It's got more stuff in. Now with added extra stuff. And so the idea behind ops and operability is this, is in the early 1800s, um, a lady called Augusta Ada Byron, uh, daughter of, of Lord Byron, um, a notorious poet and crackhead, uh, um, or opium fiend at least. Uh, so his daughter grew up in a house of, of poetry and dope, and she said, right, stuff that, I'm gonna be the first STEM at. So she goes off and, and, and learns her some science. Uh, we know her as Ada Lovelace because she became the Countess of Lovelace. And she goes and invents programming. Uh, um, so meanwhile, in the West Country, uh, Jane Austen's there going, this isn't going to end well. Right? Uh, so she invents ops. Okay? So she invented operations. And she, what she did is she tried to describe uh, um, the world of operations in a series of coded books. Uh, um, that became quite famous. Some of them became quite famous. They got edited along the way, and unfortunately, most of the ops advice fell out. So I've, I've found the originals. Uh, um, so anyway, so I guess a little bit about me. So this book belongs to me, Dan North. Hello, I'm Dan North. I've been around uh, software for about 25 years. I've been around uh, agile stuff for about 17 of those, so since before the word agile meant what it means. And I joined ThoughtWorks in 2002, who were sort of pioneers of Agile methods. And around 2005, um, I was working with... Well, I, I, I actually, I, the, the, there's two things I'm very proud of from ThoughtWorks. One is I convinced them to hire their first ops specialist. Uh, it was about 2003, 2004. The, the general culture was that you had uh, lots and lots of developers and whatever else who could just do sysadmin and they'd just do their ops things. And I, I met this chap, Julian Simpson, who's become known as the build doctor now. Um, he's a lovely Kiwi chap, and he, I met him at a client site, and he was just this phenomenal ops engineer. And I said to ThoughtWorks, we need to hire ops specialists, they're, they're, they're a different breed. And they said, oh, no, no, we don't need this. And so I convinced them, I sort of got him in under the, under the radar, and he lands on his first project, and the feedback was, can we get another three like that? And so, so I'm very pleased with that. And then around about mid-2000s, uh, I was on a particular project with about 50, and 50 people in a program team in, in split into four delivery teams. And, uh, and these four delivery teams were all slamming into the same very small number of highly contended uh, test environments. And it would take about two and a half days to get a build set up on one of these test environments. And everyone was bottlenecked at testing. In fact, everyone was bottlenecked at environments. So I built a team there, and on the way, um, so we hired Chris Reed, and then Chris and I hired Jez Humble, which was the other thing I'm very proud of, I thought worked, I hired Jez. Um, and so, and a bunch of us, we ended up with about eight people in a build team, which I, I still maintain is eight too many for a build team. Well, on the way through, we came up with a lot of the patterns that ended up in the continuous delivery book. And Dave Farley isn't here, so I can talk about him. Uh, um, he was over in another major ThoughtWorks project, um, again, developing similar sort of patterns. Then he rocked up on the, the project I was on as the delivery lead. So I'm over on the sort of build engineering side, and he's the tech lead there. And he's a phenomenal tech lead. If you ever get to work with Dave Farley, you should jump at that chance. Um, but again, so him and Jez, and actually a few of us, decided we were going to try and document some of these um, patterns and things that we'd learnt. And the only people with any longevity uh, was, were Jez and Dave, so they went ahead and finished this book called Continuous Delivery, and that's why we're all, or one of the reasons we're all here. So, um, so that's me. Uh, I left there seven years ago, end of 2009, so I'm, I'm now independent. I go around causing trouble at places, which is great fun. Uh, I get this paid entertainment. So, um, yeah. So then let's start. So let's, what I want you to do is, is this. Imagine, right, we're all, we're all technical. How many developer people here? Put your hands up if you're a developer type person. Okay, and put your hands up if you're an ops type person. Okay, oh, fewer ops people than I would like. Okay, but lots of developer people. Put your hands up if you didn't put your hand up. What kinds of people, other people do we have? Managers, are you causes of work in other people? <laughs> yes, right, okay, brilliant. So. Okay, we're all involved in some kind of technical delivery, right? So I want you to imagine a company that treats its customers like this, right? It builds a product, um, and this happens. There's no consistency in any of the products, okay? So I use this product, and I use a different product, and it works completely differently. 
um, there's no consistency within a product. So I, I, one part of the product works like this, and I go somewhere else in the product, and it's completely different. I might as well be using a different product. Okay? Um, it doesn't tell me when something breaks. I don't get told that something's broken. It, it's been broken for a while. I just happen to notice after a while. I don't know when it's, I don't know how long it's broken. It doesn't even tell me that something is broken. It looks like it's working fine. Yeah? Like everything's okay. Everything's not okay. Everything's burning behind me. Yeah? Um, it doesn't tell me when things are about to break. So I get no, I get no warning that things are going to blow up. Right? And then when it does go wrong, they blame the customer. You know, well, you are clearly misusing the, the application. You don't know what you're doing. The application's fine. Yeah? Um, and this lovely phrase, provided without warranty. Okay? So we've all used software products like this. Yeah? And I love this phrase, provided without warranty. Provided without warranty means that you're left in the dark saying things like, what happened? Right? It, just, it just stopped working. What happened? And then, and, then, and then we're all technical, so we go, how can I fix it? You know, I roll up my sleeves and get in there and monkey around with it a bit and go, how can I fix it? And then after a while, the, you, know, the, you go through the stages of grief, right? You've gone through denial, now you're going through bargaining, and you're going, can I fix it? Right? So is it even fixable? And then, and then you realize that it's probably beyond your, you know, your ability to fix this thing, and you're like, well, okay, how long is it going to be broken for then? Right? I now feel helpless, and now I'm starting to bargain. I'm like, well, come on, what can I do? How, when, 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 how long is it going to be broken? And then you start getting into the... Am I just stuck with this? You know, sort of resigned kind of, oh, okay. And then, and then you get cross, right? And then you're like, okay, who can I escalate this to? Uh, <clears throat> tumbleweed, right? And then it's like, does anyone care? Yeah, and you're just there, lonely, afraid, like just this thing's not working, okay? Provided without warranty. This is how dev treats ops, Okay? This is how developers treat operations in general. Okay? And the reason for that is quite, it's quite apparent. DevOps starts with dev pushing on ops. So the whole DevOps movement started because back in the 90s, we were rubbish at software. Okay? I started programming in the 90s. We were rubbish at software. It's not that we were rubbish programmers. All of our processes meant that systemically we were rubbish at software. It would take us literally years. If you were doing a release every 18 months, you were like state of the art. That was cutting edge, yeah? But our tools, you know, I was writing C++ in the 90s and you know, working right in billing systems for telcos, right? Which is quite a lot of software. And you change a little bit of C++ code and that's you gone for the morning. It compiles in, you know, it'll compile in as little as 20 minutes, right? But the linking, oh my goodness, who was writing C++ in the 90s? Yeah, yeah, yeah right? So that's, that's like hours and hours of linking, yeah? It's just really, really long. And so what that means is you then start working in larger batches, right? What's, what's called the transaction cost. The cost of doing work goes, is high, so I do more work in one chunk. So I do lots of coding, and then I build that. And, of course, that exponentially increases the likelihood of bad things happening. And so we needed a long runway. We needed, like, 18 months to make sure we had something that we could build. Anyway, so... Late 90s, a bunch of programmers are frustrated by this, and they start developing methods like Scrum, XP, DSDM, FDD, uh, Crystal, all these different uh, adaptive, all these different software methods to make it easier to get work done. And so these years of div releases came down to like only months. You know, I could release once per season, which was you know, pretty, pretty cool. And so what that meant is that development was no longer the bottleneck. And when you alleviate a bottleneck, this is theory of constraints, when you alleviate a bottleneck somewhere in the system, it emerges somewhere else in the system, right? So we're getting better at building software, and now we're trying to release. Well, the operations guys would release every two years, yeah? They'd blow the dust off the manuals, right? <laughs> There's another release coming through, yeah? If it took a month to get that thing live, no one cares, there's going to be another one in two years. If I'm trying to release much more frequently, that starts putting pressure on operations, and so you talk to the developers and they say, we're trying to get the ops guys to release more frequently, and ops is resisting. Ops resists, okay? The thing they don't realize is what the rest of that sentence looks like. Ops resists efforts to compromise their governance, assurance, audit, compliance, control processes, all their structures, the way they do work. That's what ops is resisting, right? The operations role is keeping the lights on. The operations role is keeping the bank running, 
you know, keeping the shop open or whatever it is. That's what operations are doing, and we're throwing <laughs> software at them, and they're saying, hang on a minute, we need to talk about this. And the reason for that is that they're still on the hook. Right? What sort of things are they on the hook for? They're on the hook for runtime operations. So there's still run books. There's still jobs that need to be done every day, every night. There's still batch processing that needs to happen. There's still maintenance of systems that need to be done. They're on the hook for SLAs. Right? They're on the hook for uptime, availability, all of that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, they're on the hook for diagnosis. Something breaks. Right? The system breaks uh, and it stops working and who's getting paged? You're not getting paged. They're getting paged. Right? Recovery. Okay, so now I've figured out what's going wrong. Uh, we need to get it working again. So we need to switch it on. And it's not, <clears throat> it's not enough to just recover a system. I also need to restore it. So, for instance, um, an awful lot of system outages end up with data corruption. Yay, it's switched on again, but data corruption. So now I've got to figure out what it means to go and get things back in a, in a runnable state. And they're on the hook for business continuity. Right? So the application fails in one place. How do, I, how do I bring it up in another place? Am I running hot, cold? Am I running hot, hot? If I am running hot, hot, what's the replication story? How consistent is the data in the, in the, in the, uh, disaster, in, in the, in the disaster center? And so this is all the stuff that ops still has to do as a day job that developers mostly aren't terribly aware of. And so this is where Jane Austen starts writing her stories. And the first book she wrote was Automation and Autonomy. So this is where it starts, okay? So automation autonomy is this. <clears throat> we as developers, I'm gonna use we as operations as well, because I kind of like to fill, I've got a foot in both camps. We as developers, we got really excited about automation. Automation was one of the big, big things that came out of the Agile movement. Uh, automated testing, automated build, automated environments, automa oh, it's so cool, right? We can automate things. And so we brought this automation and we said, look, we've, look, we've automated stuff. And the other thing that came out was autonomy, which is that the team itself is able to do stuff. So autonomy contains a number of concepts. Autonomy, the first thing autonomy says is I have the, uh, the permission to do something. I have the authority to do something. But there's no point having permission to do something unless you know how to do it. So it also means I have the skills and the knowledge to do it. And there's no point having the skills and knowledge unless you have the, the resources to do it as well. So I think about flying a plane, right? You could have autonomy to fly a plane. So that means that you have permission to fly a plane, which is great, except I don't know how to fly a plane. So you need to know how to fly a plane, it, which is brilliant, except I don't have a plane. Right? So you need all those things to be true. And then you get autonomy. And these dev teams, these early cross-functional developer teams, um, they, they hadn't existed before. We hadn't had uh, developers and testers and analysts and architects and, and people all in the same team, all working together to build something. And they had this real sense of like, we can take on the world, woo! And so they did. And this is what it looked like. So this is the downstream view of autonomy. Okay? So there's an upstream and there's a downstream view of autonomy. The upstream view of autonomy has the handle. And the downstream view of autonomy is the data center. And so we say, right, well, let's just push this to production. And let's see what happens. Yeah? And so... And so then we say, it's okay because automation, right? We've got all these automation tools, ops, we've got it, you're fine. <clears throat> and so what that looks like if you're an operations engineer is we've got, oh, yeah, we've got these, um, we've got a dozen teams and they've all picked a different technology because autonomy, right? And so now I have to learn all these tools and I have to install all these tools and patch all these tools and, and administer all these tools. And, and, oh, and they say, no, no, that's fine, that's fine. Because all that this stuff does is it sets up essentially our, our runtime environment. So all you need to know about is the runtime environment, which is essentially, it's usually an endpoint that receives messages and sends messages and stores stuff. And so what we're going to do is we're going to store stuff, right? And so all you need to, oh, hang on. Right. So... So now I need to install these things, uh, patch these things, secure these things, administer these things, update. Do you see, do you see where this is going? Yeah. This, it's, it's no fun being downstream of autonomy. Yeah. But that's okay, everyone, because infrastructure is code, and I've got it all under version control, so we're going to be fine. Yeah. <laughs> oh, hang on. Oh, not so much. Um, I had a rude awakening to this. <clears throat> I was working... Um, back in my ThoughtWorks days, we were working for a, a, a quite a large um, insurance firm. And I met their release engineer. 
And I said to release engineer, we were using uh, PVCS. Is he up there? Is PVCS up there? Yeah, there he is. Bless PVCS. Oh. Anyone use PVCS? We're looking for all the people that, with the tired, tired <laughs> lines here. Um, so it's a very big, very heavyweight source control system. And so this is what they use to manage their releases. And we were an agile team and we were causing headaches. So the, I believe it was either PVCS or it could have been um, ClearCase. One of those, they had the recommendation, the vendor recommendation was that you had one source control administrator per 10 developers. <laughs> and then GitHub. <laughs> so so this, this thing was slow, heavy, took a lot of care and feeding. And so we decided that it was too slow for us to get work done and we were gonna use Subversion. So we installed Subversion and, and we're off and running and then this chap, very, very friendly guy, he said, look, thanks, because you just made this happen to me. Right, because you're making that decision, another team's using CVS, another team's using whatever else, and I'm, I'm the release manager. I need to be able to take stuff out of these things, put them through a, a standard process, and then get them into a production environment. That's my job. Um, and all of these environments are different. And, and I'd, I'd never thought of it from their perspective. I'd never thought of what happens after I flush the chain. Yeah, And so we ended up... Uh, with a sort of uh, quite, a, quite a, I thought, a really effective uh, um, compromise, which is we would use Subversion for doing our work. When we wanted to do a release, which was fairly often, but not like, you know, madly often, we would then cut a release into PVCS. Um, that commit was then, that was then the, the, the gold, you know, the source for the release. And then he would then take it out of PVCS and do what he did with it. And this turned out to be a bit of a win-win-win because now he wasn't having the headaches of a team trying to check in several times a day where with Perforce you check in every full moon, um, <clears throat> or PVCS rather. And so, uh, and for us we could move quickly and also for him downstream now it all still looked like PVCS, which was quite nice. I didn't realise that was a thing until I went and made friends with the release manager. Go and make friends with release managers. And the problem is this, the problem is that autonomy needs accountability. Okay, otherwise you end up with lots and lots of fragmentation, you end up with lots and lots of um, divergence. Okay, uh, so once I have a dozen teams, I have no technical consistency, no technical governance. And we're trying to resolve two forces here. We're trying to resolve local autonomy and global consistency. How can you do that? How can you resolve local autonomy and global consistency? I describe this as the Spotify problem. <coughs> if you talk to Henrik Knieberg and the guys at Spotify who built the, you know, the, the famous tribes and guilds and whatever model, they will say to you, and he says this even in his talks, he says this, do not copy what we did. Do not go out and have tribes and guilds and squads and stuff. He said, don't do that. <coughs> and then what do we do? We all go, we're going to have tribes and guilds and squads because that's cool. Yeah? Don't do that. What you should do is go through the same process we went through. Ask yourself the same question. And the question they asked themselves was this. They were 300 people, and they wanted to be 3,000 people. I met them around the time they were doing this. And I said, well, why, do you want to be, why does anyone want to be 3,000 people? And they said, well, they said, the enemy, right, the competition is YouTube, it's Apple, it's Amazon. Right? We need to be 3,000 people to take them on. I was like, yep, you got me. You probably do, right? <laughs> And what they did, which I thought was rather clever, is this. They said, we are going to use Conway's law as a lever. We're going to design the organization that would inevitably build the platform we want. And then we're going to hire into that. So that by the time we get to be that size, we'll be that shape organization and we'll, and we'll, we'll win. I thought, that's so clever. And that was what the whole point of the Tribes and Guild stuff was, is they said, there's two constraints here. The first constraint is we want squads to be autonomous. All those things I said. They've got to have a plane, they've got to know how to fly a plane, and they've got to have permission to fly a plane, which means they need to know how to fly a plane safely. Yeah? So that means if a team's going to be autonomous, it needs to know about security and compliance and legal and all that stuff, as well as software. Yeah? Because otherwise it can't be autonomous. It's reckless. And globally, we want that if I look at systems over here, they kind of smell the same as systems over here and systems over here without kind of having this draconian, you shall use this stack. Yeah. So how do we find that middle ground? So, and the way they, ended, the, the way they did this was with tribes and guilds and, and all the other good stuff. Um, so I want to offer you a pattern. So I talk about a thing called contextual consistency. Contextual consistency 
is, is this, is I want to, well, there's two ways we can be consistent. What's your name? Yan. Sorry? Yan. Yan. Fantastic. Right. So there's two ways we can be consistent. One way is this. Yan is going to be in every technical meeting. Okay? Oh. Sucks to be Yan. <laughs> right? <laughs> And a bit of a bottleneck, right? It means, that, it means that things are going to move quite slowly, yeah? But we get that consistency, okay? There's another thing we could do, is we could all get a little badge. There's WWJD. What would Yan do, right? And, and, and what that is, is this. We're in a meeting. He's not here. We always ask ourselves, what, what would Yan do? What, what, how would he answer this? You know, uh, how are we going to do uh, remoting between these systems? How are we going to do logging? How are we going to do recovery? How are we going to do... And, and we don't know, because we don't really know Yan. Right? And so what we do is, to start with, we invite him along to the meetings, and it sucks. But after a while, we get how he thinks. And so now we can just go and calibrate occasionally. So we had this meeting, and we decided this. What do you think? <clears throat> and because he's smart, he doesn't say, you're wrong, you should do it this way. He starts asking questions. They're called Socratic questions. He says, so what would happen if you connected this thing to that system over there? And you go, oh, oh, is the noise of you learning, right? Oh, oh, that wouldn't work, would it? No. What would you do instead? Oh, we could do this instead. Yes, that's what you should do instead, okay? And over time, we get the hang of this. And so then we start to get that global consistency. So... The tweetable version of this is this. Given the same context <laughs> and the same constraints, we're likely to make similar decisions. Okay? That's what I'm going after. I don't want everyone to be identical at everything. What I want is that we're reasonably similar. And so let's say that we all decide that we're going to do, how we're going to do remoting, how we're going to have s systems talk to each other. What should we use? JSON over HTTP? XML over soap. soap, soap over over MQ, right? Soap over some kind of AMQP transport. Fantastic, old school, love it, right? <clears throat> it doesn't matter. Clue, it doesn't matter, right? What matters is we all just do it, okay? Because it's not the biggest decision we're going to make today. But what happens is this: over time, we get good at that, and also I notice that somewhere in the code that there's that there's uh, these two these two jokers here have been working on a piece. <clears throat> And it's using a binary protocol and we're using a memory barrier. I'm like, oi, oi, <laughs> that doesn't look like soap. <laughs> okay. And so now I go and ask, why might they have done that? Why might they be using a binary protocol using a memory barrier? Different context. Different context. What, what kind of context, though? What? Maybe it's running on an embedded device. It could be an embedded device, yep. Yeah. What else? Speed. Could be a low latency thing, could be a speed thing. Um, it could be none of those. It could be that they just thought it was cool. Because right? <laughs> they're, they're hipster. Yeah? Could be running in kernel space. It could be running in kernel space. But here's the thing. I noticed that. And I noticed that because it wasn't like all the other ones. So if we have rough consistency, I will notice the outliers. Right? I call that differences data. So when I see something unusual, that's signal. Rather than if we didn't have an opinion about how remoting worked or how, how message passing worked, everyone would just do whatever they liked, which would be fine, except now I don't know why something's there. Is it there because it's the only thing they know? Is it there because it was cool? Is it there because they copied and pasted it from Stack Overflow? Or is it there because it's necessarily a good choice? Right? So contextual consistency says if we roughly agree what normal looks like, then when we see things that aren't normal, they immediately stand out and we can go, hey, that's unusual. And that might be unusual because they didn't get the memo. Right? They didn't know that we're using SOAP and all that other stuff. Yeah? So, so that's an education thing. That's a comms thing. We didn't actually communicate that that's what we're doing. Um, it could be that they're trying something new and that thing is going to become the new normal. You know, they're, they're, they're pioneering protobufs or something like that, right? which is fantastic as long as we know that. And over time, then we discover that's a much better way of doing this than the other stuff we were doing. Sorry, Soap. Right? <clears throat> and so now that means we now need to transition the world to that. Yeah? So another tweetable version of contextual consistency is this. What's the smallest amount of advice you can give me so I'm unlikely to screw up? Okay? Here's the thing. Everyone in this room has written loads of software or delivered loads of software. Everyone. So if I asked everyone in this room to go and solve a thing, you'd all be fine. Yeah? However, there's about 200 people in this room, and I would get 200 different solutions. 
Okay? And they would probably go into about a dozen different camps, but roughly I'd get lots and lots of different things. <clears throat> because we've all got different contexts, we've all got different backgrounds. We know different things. We are different people. I love that diversity. However, diversity at scale is carnage. Right? So diversity, we want to embrace diversity and still get that contextual consistency. And so what I want is the smallest amount of advice you can give me, WWJD, yeah? The smallest amount of advice you can give me, so I'm likely in the same context to make similar choices that you would. And if we can get to there, <clears throat> we're in a pretty good place. And that's what Spotify went after, and that's what a lot of companies, I think this, this is the thing that, I, that I'd offer to people, is go after, you're trying to resolve those two forces, yeah? I want local autonomy, otherwise I can't go fast. <laughs> and I want global consistency, otherwise I can't sustain that speed. <clears throat> so this was uh, automation autonomy was like her first her, you know her first out in <clears throat> and then and then people started understanding that and so uh, so she wrote her, her second great novel support and supportability um, this is uh, uh, the Dashwood sisters Eleanor and, and Marianne Dashwood uh, um, and they were they were one of the first ops teams um, they, they meant to dash ops. And um, so, so here's the ops team, right? They don't look very happy. <laughs> I'm just going to put it out there. <laughs> they look cross. They're saying things like, you build it, you run it. <laughs> I'm just, you know, you, you crazy agile people, right? They're saying things like, they know nothing. They, they have no understanding of monitoring, right? They don't know about these things. Developers should be on the support rotor, yeah, says Angry Spice. Right? <laughs> they have no understanding of monitoring. The developers should be on the support rotor. <clears throat> now, of course, this isn't always possible. And this isn't always possible for, I think, a rather amusing reason, slash terrifying. Right? Mostly the reason that, who works in a bank here? And people are, yeah, yeah, that's a smattering. That's a good 10% of you. So, I don't know, some, some time ago, uh, a number of companies did some very naughty things, uh, Enron being one of them. And this led to a load of legislation by, by Messrs. Sarbanes and Oxley. That essentially, the, the, the main thrust of this was the idea of rogue agents. So you didn't want a rogue agent able to change some stuff and then put it live, because that was bad, right? And so they said, OK, so two people have to touch every piece of software. So you can't, the person who wrote the software can't just then go and put it into production. That's irresponsible. I like that, I think that's a great idea. So what we do is, is, we, is we, the way we implement this is we say that the team that, write, whoever writes this software, another team or another person has to put this into production. And the way that works is this, is I, I, you know, I, I write some code and I build a binary. And I hand this binary to my operations person and I say, here, you, you've got to press the button, okay? And so the operations person, luckily, is a decompiler. And so he can look at this pile of bytes and go, oh, I can see exactly what that code change is doing. <laughs> oh, no, they're not, they're a human being. Right? And so they have absolutely no oversight for anything going through there. And so you've got no governance at all. You've just got theatre. Right? And this is the way we implement Sarbanes-Oxley. A really good way to implement Sarbanes-Oxley is to pair program. If two of us are working on something, either we're both dodgy. Right? On, we, we can do this. So no one will notice. Right? <laughs> or, or one of us is going to keep the other one honest. If we have a team that's collaborating and testing each other's code as well as pair programming and doing code reviews and doing a whole load of other just good hygiene stuff, it's really, really hard for a rogue agent in that context to be able to deliver something bad. Okay, so mostly um, developers should be on the support rotor. I can't think of a context where they shouldn't. Okay, but then, <clears throat> then the question then to the devs is this, how supportable is the stuff you're building. We're building software, we're putting it into an environment in order to run, okay? How supportable is that stuff? So when something goes wrong, when something breaks, when we have an incident, there's three magic questions that I care about, okay? Three magic questions for incident management. What might they be? <coughs> when did change? What, what changed? <laughs> Excellent. Whose fault? <laughs> 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 when did it happen? When did it happen? Yeah? Where's the log file? Sorry? Where's the 
file? Where's the log file? He's already fixing it. It's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> He's on the clear channel. Get back, I've got this. Right. Sorry? What's the impact? Right, so let's take a look at what I think. I think the first thing is what happened, right? The first thing I want to know when there's any kind of incident is what happened, yeah? Which is like, what changed? Where's the log file? All of that kind of stuff. What happened, yeah? Um, the second thing I want to know is this. Who will notice? Who's impacted? <clears throat> Can I get ahead of this and contact people and say, you're about to have this unpleasant experience? so that I'm being proactive about it, rather than them saying, oh, this bad thing just happened and it's your fault. What should we do about it? And the third thing, how do we fix it? <laughs> right? how, how do we fix it? I need to get this thing working again. And in fact, there's really one question. Okay, the real question is this. How could we reduce the impact of this incident? Yeah? What could we do to reduce the impact of this incident? And this is <clears throat> how organizations like Netflix uh, have built their, org their, their organizations from the ground up. Interestingly, you know, they're the kind of the, 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 the show pony, but um, eBay was doing this 10, 12, 15 years before. All right, so eBay, the whole of the eBay system, the whole of the eBay workflow assumes that every single stage of you putting something up there, people bidding on it, everything, you know, right down to paying and closing, everything is going to fail. It assumes everything is going to fail, and therefore, how should it manage those failure conditions? And they architected from, like that from day one. Netflix does the same thing. They have, um, who's heard of Chaos Monkey? Yay, everyone's heard of Chaos Monkey, great. So who's heard of Chaos Gorilla? Fewer hands. Okay, so Chaos Monkey is running in production all the time, switching off servers, right, deleting instances. <coughs> and the idea is that, so the golden rule is no one at home is allowed to notice. So you're at home watching Orange is the New Black, and uh, someone kills the, the server that's streaming your Orange is the New Black, and you don't notice because they've got redundancy built in. There's actually more than one server streaming your particular thing. And then Chaos Gorilla, they don't run automatically, they run at weekends. Um, and Chaos Gorilla takes out an entire um, data center, uh, and so that just kills off every single server in wherever it is. And then they have once a season, once a quarter, they run a thing called Chaos Kong. <laughs> <laughs> Chaos Kong takes out a whole zone. Right? Chaos Kong just kills US West, right? Or whatever it is. They just, it just kills an entire zone. And y the golden rule is you're not allowed to notice, which means that your TV show is being, or your movie is being streamed from multiple servers within multiple data centers within multiple zones, right? Simultaneously, and it has automated failover if any of that stuff stops working. Whoa! This is just for streaming telly, <laughs> yeah? But this is, this set a precedent, it's, it's caused a shift. And the shift, it started with, I think it was Randy Schaup, um, who's the CTO at Etsy, uh, said this. <clears throat> And he said, we've grown up with, uh, like, you buy a hard drive and it's like 10,000 hours uh, MTBF. 10,000 hours mean time between failure. What that means is there is a histogram somewhere, there's a graph, a uh, probability distribution, that says if you use this hard drive, it will fail on average at 10,000 hours plus or minus a standard deviation or two. Yeah? And, and that's great until you have 10,000 hard drives. Right? When you have 10,000 hard drives, it doesn't mean that one of them is definitely going to fail. Statistics doesn't work like that. What it means is that the, the, instead of having a really pointy line like that, you have a much more smeared line like that, which means essentially you can pretty much guarantee that some portion of your estate is out right now. So you can't assume mean time between failure. What you need to assume instead is MTTR, mean time to recovery. How quickly, from, a, from being aware that something's failed, can I get it working again, right? Down to and including zero, right? So by obsessing about MTTR, Netflix can lose an entire zone and you don't notice, right? So mean time to recovery is zero. Yeah, it takes a while to spin up all the instances again, right? But you didn't notice an outage. If a, if a server fails in a forest and no one's impacted, right? <laughs> Nothing, fantastic. So, we care about mean time to recovery. And so that means that we start obsessing about availability, about recovery, about resilience. And that changes how we architect applications. 
Yeah? And this leads to architectures like event sourcing, where we can rerun and replay entire sequences of events and move forward and backwards through history. That's pretty cool, right? Um, imagine being paged at 4 a.m. for your error message. So this is my, this is my heuristic for whether, a, whether you should log a warning or an error. Should this message be a warning or an error? Right? That. Okay? It should be an error if you don't mind being woken up at 4 a.m. With that, with that message, okay? If you do, make it a warning, because it won't be you getting paged at 4 a.m., it'll be some poor bugger who has a young child, who's just got that child down at 3 a.m., <laughs> is just enjoying his or her first hour of sleep in some time, and then beep, 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 oh God, what is it? Toner low. <laughs> I am going to kill someone, but I don't know who, because there's no accountability on these things, yeah? Right? That's not okay. Right? These are other human beings' lives we're messing with here. So um, <clears throat> someone said I would go straight to the log. Here's another pattern. <clears throat> this, um, this is a pattern. I learnt this, uh, not I would say the hard way, not the hard way, but the slightly hum humiliating way, but I'm okay with that. I was working at a trading firm a few years ago with a remarkable, well, it was actually a, a remarkable team, um, but a particular chap called Neil, um, who doesn't know I'm talking about him. Uh, um, and he's a phenomenal uh, developer, uh, phenomenal human being, but he's a phenomenal developer. And he, um, he came along and he was pairing with me, and he came over, just sat, sat down next to me, he said, what are you up to? I said, oh, I'm just writing this thing. Let me tell you what it does. He goes, no, no. He said, don't tell me, let me figure it out. I was like, okay. So he sits down and he runs it. And it's like, doesn't even compile. I said, yeah, I know, I'm still busy writing it. He said, oh, that's okay. And so, you know, let's, what do we need to do to get it compiling? So, okay, close all the braces and whatever else. Okay, now it's running. Uh, what does it do? And, he's, and it immediately crashes. And I said, oh, that's because he goes, don't tell me. Let me figure it out. <laughs> and he reads the stack trace. And he goes, oh, it looks, it looks like it's trying to get some stuff from over there. And he says, uh, what's it trying to get from over there? Well, let's, let's fix that. And what I was learning, <laughs> I, don't, I, I, I suspect he was teaching me, but what's only what I was learning was this, is you should be able to figure out what's going on from the error messages all the time, even while you're developing this thing. Because if you get into the habit of, when it fails, I can see how it failed, right? I can answer those three magic questions, then that means you are systemically baking that into everything we build. Yeah? Because then when it goes live and it fails, guess what? I don't need to tell you, you can figure it out. Yeah? So what should a log message contain then? No ops people are allowed to answer. <laughs> okay? <laughs> this is a devs only quiz. What sorts of things should I have in a log message? Start calling some things out. Timestamp. A timestamp. Context. Context. A stack trace. No. Some kind of meaningful description. Some meaningful description. Oh, thank you. <laughs> no, just a, a eight-digit hex code. I think that should be fine. Yeah, yeah. Error four zero six three F. There isn't a four zero six three F. That'll get them. Right. Sorry. How to fix it. Right, now we're getting somewhere. These are the things that I think a log message should contain. It needs a timestamp, and it needs two kinds of timestamp. It needs a timestamp that a human being can read and go, oh, that's when it happened. And for pity's sake, right, with a time zone. <laughs> Either UTC or with a time zone. <laughs> because guess what? It's always 5 a.m. somewhere, right? It's always happy hour somewhere on the planet, yeah? Um, so it needs to be human readable. It also needs to be machine readable, right? It's milliseconds since the epoch is fine. Something that I can grab, something I can sort by, okay? Something that I can order. Something else that it absolutely has to have, and we are mostly, mea culpa, right? We're rubbish at this unless we learn this discipline, is I need some kind of unique correlation ID. I need to be able to, particularly in distributed systems, and as we get into smaller and smaller components and microservices and nano services and pico services and femto services, which is one ASCII character, right? <laughs> um, then we need to be able to understand what's happening in a distributed system. I need some kind of correlation ID. So <clears throat> I am a huge fan of UIDs because they are relatively, they're unique in time and space, which I think is just a pretty cool thing to be able to say about stuff. 
right? As soon as anything hits the boundary of my system, it gets a, a UID, right? It gets some kind of correlation ID. If it splits off, right, then it gets, it carries the UID and it carries some kind of branch ID. So uh, um, Dapper, there's a lovely paper from, from Google called, about, called, about a system called Dapper, which, has, uh, which describes a protocol for doing this. They call them spans. So a span is a sequence of, of hops that happen that, that, that I can then start to correlate. So I need a unique correlation ID, otherwise I can't tell the story. Okay? I need to be able to answer those three questions. Sorry, <clears throat> I need the cause, the whole cause, and nothing but the cause. Um, this is, this is a, a reference to Ted Codd. Um, he's talking about when he's talking about uh, relational databases, and you have these the three normal forms in a relational databases. You want the key, the whole key, and nothing but the key. So help me, cod. So <clears throat> um, the cause: what happened? Okay, what went wrong? Yeah, in a human meaningful way. The whole cause: I don't want to have to look in lots of different places and start. I don't want to be doing forensics right any more than I have to. Yeah, and nothing but the cause. I do not want any extraneous noise. Oh, and we had beans for tea. It's like, what, what, why is that useful? It's not. I just thought you'd like to know. I love beans, right? Okay, so we it's uh, just keep it relevant. And then <clears throat> and yeah, and so then I want answers to my three questions. So I want to know what went wrong, <clears throat> who's impacted, okay, how to fix it. If you can't tell me those things, give me pointers. Tell me where where to find out. Give me a chance to go and go and guess. And this is really, this is the sort of take home from this. I really, really want you guys to internalize this. A log message, okay, is a read-only, append-only, first-class user interface. Okay? It's a user interface, so design it like a user interface. Design it with consistency. Design it with clarity. Design it with understanding that the poor bugger reading it probably just woke up and it is 4 a.m. And if it's not, if it's not as, if it's no worse than the tone of being low, woe betide you. Okay. So logs and append only, read only, user interface. So that's support and supportability. But now. That's not enough, because we also need to start shipping this stuff, right? We need to deploy this stuff. And so then we get her, her other famous book, Pride in Packaging. Um, this is uh, about a, a young option engineer called uh, Lizzie Bennett and, and a chap called Darcy, who's a uh, Rails programmer. Um, <laughs> Massive ego, right? tiny little apps. You just, oh, it's, it's just real imbalance. So I, what, what can you do? Um, in later, funny enough, in later editions of this, he's, he's a Node.js programmer. But, but, uh, uh, someone, someone said that was harsh. Is that harsh? Okay, maybe that's harsh. Okay, um, which opens with one of the most famous lines in English uh, literature, which is this: "It is a truth universally acknowledged that a developer in possession of a build must be in want of a server." <laughs> Okay, so, so that's it, I've got my app and I want to put my app out into production. And, and so here I am, automating the deployment, yeah, that's one thing, right? That, that's great, well done, right? But that's not all of it. So I did some work um, at Ordnance Survey. Um, actually, I'm doing some work at Ordnance Survey. They're, they're a very lovely organisation. If you ever get to meet them, they're really nice. And I met an ops engineer there, a chap called Keith. And he tells this story, so I feel okay telling this story. And he said, because um, I went down to visit them, and I, I, one, one, of the, one of my sins is I wrote a paper called The Build Production Line um, back in 2006 with Jez Humble and Chris Reed, um, which kind of was one of the first articulations of this whole build pipeline stuff. And so I'm the build pipeline guy. So, so he goes, oh, let me show you this build pipeline we've got, this automation, this stuff we've done. And I said, okay, that's great. And he shows me, and it's a thing of beauty, and he's clearly spent a lot of time on this thing. So I said, so... That's brilliant. What impact has it had? So what do you mean? So what, what impact has it had? Let's measure the path to production. So we just got post-its on a wall, like super low-tech value stream mapping. And we measured from I've got a feature to um, the, the, the features live. Um, what, what's, what's that, how long does that take? And it took <coughs> days, right? Uh, and, and we looked at the <coughs> days, and we looked at the impact that his work had had, and his work had taken 45 minutes off of that <coughs> days. And he went, oh. 
And this, this is my, this is why an, an illustration of why they're lovely people. He didn't go. He said, "That's brilliant. I know what to go after." Okay. And the next time I saw him, he had halved the number of days by just making a bunch of process changes. Okay. So it's not enough to just automate deployment. You need to understand the release process, understand the path to production. There's going to be gates there. There's going to be sign-offs there. There's going to be assurances there. There's going to be people that you need to get involved in things there. We can do a whole bunch of things to make that path to production less painful, right? But we need to understand it. But then I would argue that having something worth deploying is something else again. Yeah. And so then I start thinking, what are table stakes? What's table stakes for something deployable? And so here's my the last pattern I want to share with you. Phone home, okay? So if you're going to put a component into an environment that I'm looking after, the absolute minimum table stakes is this. It has to have a heartbeat. It has to be saying, I'm alive, I'm alive, like that, okay? It has a heartbeat. There are many, many ways of giving something a heartbeat. But unless I know something's there, right, you've already made my job 100 times harder. Yeah, there's, a, there's a lovely uh, bash.org, which is little fragments of, of IRC from back in the day. And one of the little fragments says, I've just lost a server. So what happened? No, I physically lost a server. I don't know where it is in the building. Right? <laughs> right? These, the, these things happen. Yeah? So, so don't go to bash.org because you'll be there for hours and you'll waste a load of time and so it'll be my fault. So don't do that. Do that. Uh, um, so lots and lots of ways to, to, to heartbeat. So my favorite, because it's by far the simplest, okay, is you just send out a UDP packet. Okay? You just broadcast. Okay? So it's, it's um, uh, connectionless. I just send it out into the world. Okay? Uh, multicast packet. And so, so then people can, uh, and any server that's interested in that, uh, what's called a group, basically an IP address, can listen and can hear those, those, those heartbeats. Okay? I can do that. I can. Now we've got, uh, you know, fabrics and, and Kubernetes and, and, and cool stuff. Right? I, can, I can write to a service registry. I can write into my console. I can write to my etcd in a little heartbeat. A little bit more complicated, but again, it means that I now know where something is and, and when it was last alive and all that kind of stuff. Um, I can send a message in SOAP. Right? <laughs> I can send little SOAP messages out into the world. Yeah? It doesn't actually matter. Right? I was mentioning earlier on uh, Dapper, they, they, their format, they have a thing called Zipkin. There's tons of clients for Zipkin. And again, it's got this really nice message format for sending out exactly this kind of heartbeat message. Okay? Um, <clears throat> a single packet can carry 1,500 bytes. That's a lot. You can pack a lot of information into 1,500 bytes. So um, here's one I prepared earlier. Okay, this, was, this is an example from a real app. The names have been changed. But here's some things it has. It has a name. So that says what this thing's called. Right? So if I'm going to look it up in a registry or whatever, that's what it's called. What app does it belong to? Because it's only one component. This component you know, it's, from, it's from my online shop. And this online shop is made up of many components. This is the product search piece. Okay? Um, and it has a requires. Requires is great because that means I can now dynamically build up a network diagram of all the connected components. And that means I can answer question two. Who's impacted? Because if that component goes down, sorry, if, if other or components goes down, yeah, what does that mean? That means that this guy's probably going to suffer. Yeah? So if any of my dependencies, so I can build a dependency graph. Way cool, right? Where is it? It's got a host and a, a port. Yeah? Um, heartbeat's interesting. It has the interval, 500 millis, so to a second, but it then has an MIA, missing an action interval, which is how long does it need to be dead for before I care? Because it may be on a flaky network segment. So if I'm not getting to a second, if I'm getting four every second, right, what does that tell me? Like twice. There's two instances running. I've got a rogue one that I forgot about. Yeah? Uh, We've done that, right? We've done that, says, <laughs> says Chris, right? <laughs> not looking very happy. And once you know that, once you know that, your monitoring can pick this up automatically. If I don't hear from you for five seconds, I'm going to assume you're dead. So now I can have a simple dashboard that's green if you're alive, yellow if I haven't heard from you for up to five seconds, red if you've gone. And in fact, what we did in one place was we made it bright, brightness of color, was how recent that was. So bright green, something's just appeared. Bright red, something's just died. Dull red, it died ages ago and apparently no one cares. Yeah? Right. 
<laughs> build servers. Yeah. Um, very quickly then, the config is static stuff. This is things about its life, right? How, how did it get born? Yeah. And then status is what it's looking like right now. So just really simple, you know, stats about what's running. Yeah. And then some rel stuff at the bottom because because rest. Right? So now this tells me where I can go and find out a bit more detail about that config. So I've seen this done with SNMP. Um, it doesn't matter, right, as long as you're heart beating. Okay? So then, ops and operability, which I think was her greatest work, right, um, is really use and usability. Right? It's user experience. If we're designing something to be operable, yeah, then it means that we're thinking of the ops people as first class users. What is user experience? Someone give me a definition of user experience. Oh, a load of software people. No one can answer. <laughs> What's user experience? That's worrying. How annoyed someone gets when they use your stuff? How annoyed someone gets when they use your stuff is almost exactly the answer I was looking for. How easy is it for someone to figure out what they want? How easy is it for someone to figure out what they want? So there's a chap called Bill Buxton. He's a, um, a UX um, researcher, actually, at Microsoft. Very, very interesting guy to listen to. He came up with by far my favorite definition of usability, of user experience. He says, user experience <laughs> is the experience the user has. <laughs> it's not rocket science, right? <laughs> What he's talking about, though, is an emotional experience. The experience is frustration, is resentment, is anger, is, or is surprise, is delight, yeah? Is, wow, you really thought about this. This is amazingly consistent. I can figure out what to do, yeah? That is user experience. When we are building systems, we are designing user experience. We are causing someone downstream of us to have an experience at some point in the future. What will that experience be? Will it be joy? Will it be frustration? Will it be low toner? Right? <laughs> so developers, here's your homework. What does it feel like to build your software? Does it feel like going through a manual run list check thing and make sure I've pulled all the pieces in and oh bloody hell that thing's in, oh no Nexus is down again, what are we going to do? Right? Does it feel like that? What does it feel like to deploy your software? Does it feel like I have to make a little snowflake every single time, which is really frustrating and time consuming because I'm a human being too? What does it feel like to test your software? Yeah? What does it actually feel like to test your software? I know, I know you, you know, I'm hoping we all test our software. For someone else to test your software, what does it feel like? What's the experience for them? What does it feel like to monitor your software? To be the person where when a system fails, they go, oh, I'm really glad it's that system that failed. I'll have it up again in no time. Or they go, oh no, oh no, not that system. Oh no, not on my watch. What am I going to do? It's 12 minutes to the end of my shift. I didn't notice, right? <laughs> yeah? What does it feel like to monitor your software? Okay. Um, and most importantly, what does it feel like to support your software? What does it feel like to be the person downstream? Yeah? Ops folks, you've got some homework too, right? How can you help developers help you? <coughs> right. What can we do to create those feedback loops? Okay. How can we collaborate with developers so that they understand what our world looks like? How can we bring them on that journey? Yeah. Uh, how can we help them help themselves? Right. So things like self-service infrastructure, self-service provisioning. <clears throat> That's fantastic. It means that they get used to thinking like operations people. Right? When, they, when they build it, they run it, they, they organize it themselves, that's really exciting. That means that they're starting to, to, to get it. Right? And then, you know, with respect, <laughs> how can we get out of their way? I think the heart of continuous delivery, the core, core message of continuous delivery, is when operations people stop providing things and instead enable things. Okay? As long as ops people are providing things, they're a bottleneck. They are in line in the process. As soon as they provide something, they're out of the way and the stuff's going hurtling through. One of my buddies at Google says we have the best site engineers I've never met. <laughs> right? He means it. Yeah, everything is text, right? Network uh, topology changes are text. DNS changes are text. Spinning up 10,000 servers to run your stuff on is text. Right? Code changes, everything's text. Yeah? I would say it's not as code, it's as text. 
Right? Everything's a text file, everything gets pushed into version control, that causes all kinds of stuff to happen, including inline code reviews. Right? How can we get out of their way? And most importantly, where should you start? Because don't try and boil the ocean. Yeah? Pick one thing, pick a thing that you're going to go after. And then we end up with, oh, that's better. <laughs> cool, that's a lot less scary. Right? Happy ops. Happy ops say things like this. They say, developers study how we work. They come and talk to us. Yeah? They listen to us. They learn about release engineering. They understand that SRE is a thing. They understand that they're not done when they finish coding and checked in. Right? They look beyond their own apps. They look horizontally and they say, it's not just me and the stuff I'm building. There's a whole bunch of other people here building things and we need to make sure that there's a consistent message going downstream to the operations, the data center, so that they can manage this stuff. They learn about security. They study all of the illities. They study security and compliance and, and the legal side of things. They study all of the parts that make it safe for us to deploy uh, software. If they're in a bank, they understand all the controls, and they understand that the controls aren't there to stop them doing work. They're to make it safe to be a bank, right? They're devs thinking like ops. Devs thinking like ops. There should be a word for that. <laughs> and that's all I had to say, really. Thank you. So do enjoy the rest of your day. Um, thank you for uh, your time this morning. Nice time we have oh, we've got time for questions. Uh-oh. Questions from the audience. OK. There's a hand up at the front. Yes, I'd love to have a beer with you later. So fantastic talk. Very thank lovely you. way you pull those patterns out of that and give us something that we can take away in action, particularly correlation IDs. Correlation IDs are the best thing since um, sliced bread. But my question for you is... Yes. Um, I'm, I've been, I'm CTO for a small startup. We started with just a couple of us. We've grown a team that does everything. So we're responsible from the stack all the way from CSS at the top down to Ansible deploying stuff into AWS at the bottom. And we have now, just having got a round of funding, we've just started to do extract method on our team and hired our first ops engineer. Do you have any kind of um, advice or suggestions or kind of things that you think, oh, hang on a minute, you should have a look at this or anything. Is this, is this a path that you've sort of seen people take or kind of, uh, what I'm keen not to do is end up with, oh, here's dev and here's ops and ah. Yeah. So that is a, well, I could speak for another hour just on that. Um, so the thing I try to bear in mind and the thing I do spend a lot of time coaching people on is, oh, I'm gonna come, I'll come down there because you're down there. I, I can do that. Look, I can walk. How about that? The um, thing I think, I think about a lot is when you're building an organization, and if it's two of you or if it's 200 of you, the goal of that organization is to flow value. <coughs> okay? Everything about an organization is flowing value. And that's whatever kind of organization. If you're a nonprofit, um, if you're a charity, if you're you know, an uh, education rather than finance, or something, then, then value means a different thing. But essentially, you identify what that value is. Value is some kind of impact to end users, right, to customers. And the goal is to flow value through that organization. The actual goal is to sustainably flow value through that organization. So flowing value is easy for a while, right, but then either people burn out or whatever, or you get fragmentation. So the sustainably bit is about that contextual consistency. So. What tends to happen, if you look at most org shapes, is they are, they're not the right shape to get work done. They're a shape that projects the history of the organization. So this is where we acquired that company, which is its own little fiefdom. Uh, this is where we had a massive sales increase, so there's a huge amount of salespeople over there. What we're not doing is looking at how value flows through the organization and building an organization that is optimized to flow that value. And we use metrics that fight against that. I know Steve's talking about measurements later on, so I hope he's going to touch on some of this stuff. Um, we mostly use cost metrics, uh, efficiency metrics. So we're looking at things like how busy people are. People are busy. I hope you're all expensive, because you should be, right? You're all expensive, and so to get most value out of you, I need you all 100% busy. It turns out that as soon as people are 100% busy, they get zero work done. It's called Little's Law. Yeah. So the busier someone is, the higher... Um, utilization you have, the closer to zero, the closer to infinity is the lead time on things. So rather than obsessing about 
uh, resource efficiency. I want to obsess about flow efficiency. So lead time metrics, cumulative flow, all of that kind of stuff. And so bringing in people with specialist skills is fantastic, right? Like I said, I mean, it was, I, I think it was a pivotal thing for ThoughtWorks, certainly in the UK when we hired Julian. Really he brought in a very different kind of mindset and the developers in the team, and, and again, this says a lot about the kind of organisation it was, is they didn't go, oh, you know, stand back, we know this. They were like, whoa, that's some pretty cool chops, right? <laughs> what can we learn here? And we also need more people like that. Now, you're, you're exactly right to recognise that the failure mode is then to put that person in a silo and they go off and ops the crap out of things, yeah? Is instead, we're still instrumenting the work and we're flowing the work through, and what can he or she do to enable that work to flow more effectively? And that should always be the goal. And I think then you'll start to build an organisation designed around flow of value rather than designed around hierarchies of people. So. Questions? One over there. Hi. That was Hello. a great talk all around. Thank you. Uh, I have kind of a specific technical question. Uh, the heartbeat messages seem very powerful, but I'm wondering, in that case, you're depending on an external system like the monitoring system to make a lot of inferences about the application. How do you compare that to having, for example, a health check, you know, simple HTTP endpoint, and then it's the system itself who knows how to, how to um, assert if it's working properly or not, and just provides that answer, yes, I'm okay, or I'm not okay. So are they complementary? So, yeah, I, I see there's different ways to solve the same problem. So, <clears throat> the things to solve for, there's, there's five, well, <clears throat> I used to think of it as a four stages process, but there's now a fifth one. I think, uh, because Netflix. But the way, the way I think about it is this. You, you need instrumentation. That's step one. Instrumentation is, can this thing tell you about itself? Right? If it can't, it doesn't matter about any of the rest of it. Then you need telemetry. So telemetry is the ability to tell someone the thing it's measuring. So telemetry means, is literally means uh, measuring at a distance. Then I need, there's no point telling someone that, that you're out of disk space or whatever unless someone's listening. So that's monitoring. Okay, so you've got instrumentation, telemetry, monitoring is now I'm uh, looking at this stuff. And then finally alerting. Yeah, so this is now responding to. So monitoring is I need to actively be watching this thing. Alerting is passive. I can be doing anything I like and I get a tap on the shoulder. And the fifth of my four is predicting. Right, so this is now where, where folks like Netflix are using machine learning to, to know when they're likely to get a burst and to proactively provision additional servers and that kind of thing. So you need to solve for at least those first four, okay? Or actually, at least the first three. The first three are table stakes. Uh, instrumentation, telemetry, monitoring. If I don't have those, I, I can't tell what's going on. How you do that telemetry piece, there's a bunch of, re you know, a bunch of ways to do that. One is <clears throat> all of these guys are speaking to some kind of monitoring infrastructure. And again, that's not necessarily a single point. It could be a whole fabric, <clears throat> and there's a whole different sets of monitoring listening to different kinds of heartbeats. Or it could be something that's going out to the various different nodes and asking them how they are. So how the message gets from one into the other, I don't have an opinion on. There's, you know, there's some great articles out on the intertubes about the pros and cons of both. I tend to, my head tends to prefer that the service itself, the component itself, is responsible for emitting stuff out into the ether, and then it's up to your runtime environment, whatever that looks like, to be listening to that and having opinions about it. I think that's a sensible separation of duty. Uh, um, but again, I've seen both, and the, you know, I've seen both work well. Yeah. Cool. Do we have one more question? Ah, uh, I, I did Hello. a great talk. Um, Thank you. Uh, question. Um, do you know how you get the balance uh, between autonomy and uh, consistency right? And is there any, do you know of any examples who, who kind of nail that, that balance? Um, what you're asking, I think, is the absolute essence of org design, right? Of what I'm calling organizational agility. So organizational agility is the ability to uh, respond quickly as an organization at an enterprise scale to respond quickly to new information. So that means you need to be, you need to have the feedback mechanisms to receive that information. You also need to have the internal nimbleness to then turn on a dime and say, that's what we should be going after. Um, that is really, really hard to do. It's really, really hard to do at scale. And again, so 
the sorts of patterns I'm talking about here, this is, these are the things I go after. So how do I get the, the autonomy part is really difficult to introduce in a command and control organization. Right? The, the idea that a, that a team can unilaterally decide to release something freaks people out. So what work do we need to do so that they're not freaked out? And it's usually, you know, and, and again, you've got to understand this from both sides. It's not kind of, oh, you know, developer, the, the dev team's going, oh, yeah, these guys are idiots, they should just let us release. Well, no, they're typically very smart people, and they've been burnt before, so let's go and find out how they got burnt, and let's assure them, let's give them the confidence that this isn't going to happen. So we need to do the running to make it safe for us to, and so we need to earn our own autonomy. And then the consistency bit, honestly, I've only seen it come from really, really strong technical leadership. You know, and really strong technical governance. So, uh, and I'll, again, I'll name check him because he's not here and he totally should be, is Dave Farley is one of the best technical leaders I've worked with. He, um, my favorite, one of the favorite things that he did was at ThoughtWorks, there was a, a program team of 100 people in, let me get this right, in five offices in uh, four time zones in three continents, okay? all slamming into the same code base. So basically a you know, single build, single pipeline, single whatever else, um, follow the sun you know, to US, India, UK. Uh, um, and across 10 teams of about 10 people, they had eventually, um, after he, he got involved about halfway through, they moved towards a very, very technically consistent world. And they did it because he just worked really bloody hard. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, technical governance doesn't happen. You have to, it, it's a bunch of choices. Um, and likewise, local autonomy doesn't just happen. It's a, it's a bunch of um, quite challenging organizational maneuvers. But you, you, you can get there. You can get there. Cool. Okay, I think that's all the time I think we have. We're out of time. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you very much. <laughs>